Hey moms, looking for some lighthearted guidance on this crazy journey we call parenting? Join me, Sabrina Kohlberg. And me, Andy Mitchell, for Pop Culture Moms. Where each week we talk about what we're watching. And examine our favorite pop culture moms up close to try to pick up some parenting hacks along the way. Come laugh, learn, and grow with us as we look for the best tips. And maybe a few what not to do's from our favorite fictional moms. From Good Morning America and ABC Audio. Pop Culture Moms. Find it wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome to the Ballet Help Desk Podcast. My name is Jenny, and I am joined by my co-founder, Brett. We are both proud ballet moms who met backstage at our children's recital. During our kids' training, we found that resources were limited. We relied mostly on Dance Magazine and parents in the lobby for information. Now that our kids are embarking on their professional careers, we're excited to share our combined 20-plus years of experience as ballet moms with all of you. We'll be bringing in experts to help make sense of this complex world of ballet training. It's back to school for dancers, too. So while you're out buying new backpacks and notebooks, be sure to check out our Refresh Your Dance Bag Guide with some of your dancers' favorite products with discounts up to 25% off select items exclusively for our Ballet Help Desk family. Head over to BalletHelpDesk.com to find some of your favorite brands like Orza, Bodil, and Alev, just to name a few. And don't forget to pick up our Ballet Corrections Journal. It is a must-have to start your year off on the right foot. We're nearing the end of our mental health and wellness series. Today, we welcome Rachel Barr. She is a former professional ballet dancer and current director of research and health at Canada's National Ballet School. Her team supports the health and wellness of professional dance students who train there, helping them access on-site healthcare professionals and navigating the healthcare system outside of the school. So without further ado, the help desk is now open. Hello, and welcome back to the Ballet Help Desk. I'm Brett, and I am joined by my co-founder, Jenny. So Rachel, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. So let's just jump right into this. You were a professional dancer before you joined the Artistic Health Department at NBS. Can you tell us a little bit about how you ended up going from being a dancer to doing what you're doing now? Sure. I mean, I think even as a dancer, I was always interested in the science behind my craft. So but just out of curiosity, I was reading, learning a, a lot of in the uh, sports sciences and sports psychology. And so when I went back to school, it made sense for me to kind of go in, in that direction when I stopped dancing. But the other piece for me, I think, is that I, I have always felt really grateful to be part of the, the ballet community, and especially here at NBS. So the opportunity to give back in, in a way where I, you know, the next generation of dancers, of students at the school with what I've learned, my knowledge to pass that on has just been really fulfilling. It's, it's, it's a joy. And so did you create the wellness program at NBS or did you come into a program that was already, had already been formed? So NBS has a long history of supporting wellness. I would say from what I can tell, even before my time, even, even in the eighties, there was already initiatives that were being explored about, well, you know, we can't just train them, we actually have to support their health and wellness, given all the demands. So a lot of that has been there a a lot. Artistic director for 35 years, Mavis Stain, she's always been someone who supported evidence based practice, didn't shy away from evolving practices to support dancers health and wellness. So all of that was the stage that was already set. And I came into this role in 2020. And that's when we officially formed the artistic health department at the school. But there were already health initiatives and supports in place. We just solidified it a little bit in terms of its structure and approach. That's interesting. And how have you seen it evolve since you've come into the department? It's evolved in a lot of ways. I mean, we had this plan to launch the department in 2020, I would say before the pandemic, but obviously the the pandemic did shape it in its first stages a, a little bit. So really, it's on the last couple of years that we've been able to see it continue to develop further, which is really exciting. It's been about building the team and, you know, building our our protocols and evolving them, right? The research, the evidence is always developing both in the sports sciences and more and more specifically in the dance sciences. And so taking that information, those learnings, and then thoughtfully implementing it into our unique setting is work, you know, it's not, it's not an automatic, you know, you see interesting work coming out about 
dancers' health, but we have to consider the context. We're working with young dancers. They're away from home. You know, they also have their academics here. So it's constantly evolving, but I, I do feel like we're starting to pick a momentum in terms of taking some of those bolder steps with our work. So the research you're doing, can you talk a little bit about some of the research programs that you're engaging in right now? Sure. There's formal research that we're, we're doing at, at the school, and that's, that's research for the the public that we intend to publish and, and share. But ongoing since the formation of the Artistic Health Department is internally, we are tracking a lot of the markers that we want to see change over time. So for example, we, we track our student in injuries. They're not just seeing a physio if they're injured, but we're, we're looking at the types of injuries, the frequency of injuries, the recovery rate, the severity of injuries, and using all of this to inform planning, you know, prevention on all levels, right? The Primary prevention, of course, we want to prevent injury before it's, it, it happens. We know, though, that this is not, you know, not always possible. We are, these are elite athletes. Right? They're putting a lot of stress on their body. So can, what can we do at the secondary prevention stage when, when mm -hmm. aches and pains, teaching our dancers to care for themselves, to speak up, to modify before things get worse? And then, of course, the, the tertiary prevention, like when they're injured, making sure that we have clear guidelines that how to support the dancer to, to come back, to take the time they need, come back uh, stronger. So that's really like more, I would say, internal evaluation that is, is mm -hmm. ongoing. And then we have had some uh, formal research projects in this area. We've published a little bit on the implementation of the nurse practitioner role at the school, which is a, a unique role for our, a ballet school to have in, in their artistic health department. So we're doing some formal research to share with the with the dance community and then also the internal stuff for us to learn and continue to develop. Can you describe overall your program in some detail? Sure. I mean, so the artistic health department is, I can, well, first maybe I'll describe the humans in it. So I manage a wonderful department. We have a full-time nurse practitioner whose specialty is, is pediatrics. We have a full-time physiotherapist. We have a full-time athletic therapist who's also our conditioning coach, and we have yoga instructor. So we have internal group. I should add also, we have a, a dotted line to our food services because we work very closely with food services as well, because nutrition obviously is so important. But then the department is also sort of the connection to all the external resources that the students have access to as well. So Quite intentionally, our mental health supports are external to the school. And so we have a, we have a team that we, we know we direct our students to um, for their mental health support. And we have a orthopedic surgeon, a sports physician, podiatrist. These are experts in the community who we have a relationship with so that we don't just send our dancer out to get their support and never hear back. And there's no connection that, that they actually can circle back to our internal health department and we can ensure we're providing like a more fulsome circle of care and make sure that the advice that they've given the dancer is also what we're following internally as well. Those are the people. We also, artistic health is really central to our life skills program. So this is a course that our students do from the, the youngest age 11 students to um, our 18, 19 year olds that they typically get, you know, weekly and it's a full range of topics, right? It's exactly what it sounds like, life skills. So early young students are learning about hygiene and, you know, puberty and, and those kinds of basic things. But we get into important issues related to dancers' life as well. We talk about mental health. We talk about preparing for auditions, all sorts of things that are helpful for dancers to know. We have a, a guest come in and talk about, you know, contracts, because that's something as you get older, you want to know what to do with, whether it's to rent an apartment or to sign a company contract or a freelance contract. So this is this is sort of also we see when we look at wellness, right? It's like, how are we building these like robust humans to flourish both as dancers, but as people when we set them out in, into the world? When you talk about the mental health part of this, what are some of the things that you're doing in that arena? Yeah, it's a it's a great question. I mean, we do know some of the things that come up more with our dancers. So of course, eating disorders is a big one. We know that our dancers are, are at higher risk, like any aesthetic sport. And so there's a few a few things. First of all, and most importantly, the systematic changes that you know the school has made over the last couple of decades culturally in terms of how we're managing sensitive issues like body weight um, are critically important. Uh, making sure that there's respect in the studio and 
comments about somebody's body aren't, aren't making them and it goes without saying, but I just want to emphasize that the systematic prevention approach is, is the most important, I think. And then on the individual level, so for example, I do work, because this is um, one of my areas of research and was also in my, my clinical training about eating disorder prevention. And this is bringing awareness to the students about the risk. You know, what does it look like? It doesn't kind of show up one day full throttle. It kind of develops over time, typically. Mm-hmm. For example, and in, I always say to the students, if if any of these thoughts, if any of these behaviors seem familiar to you, like, or you're experiencing them, you know, now's the time to reach out and get support. You're not the only dancer to navigate this. Maybe one of, one of the most you know, sort of gratifying things in my work is when, you know, like a, a day or two later, where like, I'll get an email from, from a student being like, hey, can we talk? And I think that that goes a long way where, where giving, empowering the students to kind of say like, oh yeah, I don't really want this to get worse. And I, it's very explicit if I'm having these thoughts, if I'm engaging these behaviors, giving them a chance to uh, reach out and some of them do. And so I think, uh, you know, when I, you look at the prevention, you know, maybe it's it's already secondary prevention if they're reaching out there, but it is I think a, a step in an important direction for the dancers. You start, isn't you brought up eating disorders? How does NBS handle working with students who are presenting with disordered eating or are are looking like you're concerned that they may have an eating disorder? Right. So I mean, if if we're talking about a concern about somebody looking like they're they've lost weight, underweight, things like that that are observable, they typically do. We will ask them to be checked by our nurse practitioner. We do follow guidelines that give us sort of cutoffs, right? If we determine based on their age, if their their BMI is, is lower than that, then then there is a, a cutoff that you're, you need to pause training. Um, but of course, that also comes with the support that we would we would provide them, which would typically be the emotional support of therapists with expertise in, in eating disorders. It would come with like a support from our dietitian. So we would want to support them through it. At the same time, though, we do have to be quite strict. It can be tricky. So we we have to have really objective ways of deciding who needs to stop dancing and then also clear about how they return. So adopting very, very clear guidelines for a dancer, for their family, but when when it's safe for that their return to really emphasize the severity, the danger of this stuff and not give it a chance to get any worse. If if it's if it's there, then we strive to kind of nip it in the bud as much as possible. So when you say you have these guidelines, collectively, how do they get decided? Is it is it you and the artistic director or or are you bringing in experts in the field? How are you how are you making those determinations? So our, the guidelines we're using are actually the Prix de Lausanne's guidelines. So the Prix de Lausanne is a, one of the largest international ballet competitions for student dancers. Their team, I want to say about like 20 years ago, came up with some really valuable guidelines taking into account that dancers from different parts of the world may have different BMIs at different ages. And so it's really the most conservative. We're accounting for the fact that they're small boned. We're accounting for the fact that genetically they they may be smaller. And if then you're still below that unsafe to train marker, that's been, that's based again on uh, research about when you get, basically when you get into a danger zone, when you're at risk for organ failure, when you're at risk for uh, serious uh, problems and um, obviously there's a stage before that that that's when we're aiming to cut them off but but those are the reasons why we're saying now is time to pause because we can't let you get to that next they are objective evidence-based guidelines they're not ours and just to clarify that also goes through our nurse practitioner so again it's it's objective it's not intentionally the artistic director takes I think a sidestep a little bit area because we don't want it to, it has nothing, when we say this to the dancer, this is not about your dancing. This is about, we, you, you can't, you're not going to be able to dance if you're not well. Um, so it's coming from the health department. And then obviously we should, we'll share that saying we need, this person needs to stop training. It sounds like you have quite a few programs. As you were getting them off the ground, where did you experience the most pushback? Hmm. I think the most challenging thing for us actually is time. So Our program has much more than other uh, programs, a heavy emphasis on academic studies. So the focus, of course, is on creating like the next generation of of dancers here. But from the from, you know, the founding of of the school, there's always been a priority on 
the whole person. Really, like a chunk of the day goes to academics that you don't always see, especially in the senior years and in other professional ballet schools. And so trying to incorporate all these things that we know will be good for them, all the different cross-training, all the different education we want to provide them specifically around dance is tricky. They, when we, they have to do class every day, you know, there's going to be rehearsals. There's certain things that they have to do. And then you're trying to add on top. And, you know, if, if we, we kept them from eight to eight every day, you know, they, they, they'd probably fall down um, from exhaustion. So that's counterproductive. So I think, I think time is really, is really the challenge. And that's where I was saying, you know, we're, we're always looking at the, at research and, and practices that have been proven to be effective in, in other schools or in other, in the sports sciences, but then trying to kind of implement it in our unique setting takes time. We're constantly evolving and trying to figure out what, what do we need to prioritize and what do we, do we need to prioritize now? How did you get buy-in from the teachers or did you get buy-in from all of the teachers? Was that a process for you or were they pretty invested in, in some of these things right away? I would say we're really lucky at NBS because I feel that our artistic team is, is all in that. I think they've always been on board to kind of work and even excited to have, you know, more health resources on site. I don't know if it, if it's helpful. I also, my, you know, I came from the artistic faculty. I started at the school teaching, teaching dance. I went to the school. So there, there, there wasn't necessarily the, the separation that you see in some of the schools where the health department doesn't really have as much of a connection to the work being done in the studio. And i uh, the majority of, of our artistic health team actually has some background in dance as well. So that shared passion, I think, is really resonates. So I haven't felt that, I think, um, in the same way that maybe health teams in some of the other ballet schools have experienced it. So I once think- you... Um- once you implemented some of these programs, you know, everybody will put a program in place and you realize that, oh, there's things that may need to be modified. After you implemented kind of the holistic program overall, did you find that there were some areas where you were lacking or, or things that really needed to be tweaked? There's always things that need to be tweaked. <laughs> I mean, the dancers are, the human beings that are showing up at our front door are are different, right? Like the- sure. In all sorts of ways. So that that, that for sure, I, I think, I don't know if the tweaking is ever going to stop. You know, we're learning to consider how do we give the dancers the the tools and the courage to go out into the world and, and, and flourish on their, on their own. And it's finding the balance between giving them all the support they need without restricting their ability to build their own confidence that they can manage things themselves. So what does that, what does that mean? I, I, we want our dancers, if they're in pain, to see physio, of course. We want them to have tools to navigate little aches and pains too on their own, especially as they're getting older and ready to kind of depart from school. And so finding that balance that there isn't a over-reliance on port, the nurturing support you have at school, that it's there, it needs to be there, it's it's essential, but also that it's not taking the place of a dancer's development of of, of independence in terms of managing their own health and wellness. Sure. That, that all makes sense. I I guess what I'm getting at is, you know, we've heard from several ballet students that, you know, some of the services that get offered in wellness programs, they either, there either isn't enough of that service offered or they don't take advantage of it because they don't think it's necessarily set up to give them what they're looking for that's kind of what I was getting at with regard to your program is, did you put any programs in place where the kids were like, yeah, that's not really what we were looking for, or you had just incredible demand and you found that you needed to bulk up that part of your, your services. Yeah. So I, I haven't had the experience where our students haven't wanted to take advantage of services, but I will say, because this is another research study that we did is that I do know that there is a consideration around trust when you have an internal health department. And you see the same, there's some work published around this with, um, you know, sport team doctors, right? If you're the doctor mm-hmm. for, this, for the team, are you really working for the athlete? Or are you working for the team, right? And so, right. so we surveyed our students that this was part of a research project. And, and they're, they're, we did see that there, understandably, there is some hesitation and they're also young people and, you know, they're, they're trying to figure out wh- who they can trust. And so it's been really important in the last couple of, couple of years that we 
make sure our students understand limits of confidentiality, make sure we understand they understand who they're consenting to share their information with when we want the information to be shared because we think it's valuable that their ballot teacher knows about their injury. We think it's valuable, important that, you know, we call their parents. So it's getting their consent and seeing us like the ongoing practice of that. And we we do that as something internally. Like I said, we we regularly try to kind of check in on our students and anonymously through surveys. And we, we, we do see, I, I'm optimistic that the trust is getting better, mm-hmm. but, uh, but it's a real phenomenon we see not just in, in our school. And I think that's probably potentially, you know, if you're hearing from other dance students that th- there is hesitation around trust, right? They don't want anything to compromise their opportunities as a dancer, if that's what they're passionate about. And so right. it's, and we don't want, to compromise that either. So it it is really important to be thoughtful and respectful about that. And how do we educate them to understand, you know, we are working with registered healthcare professionals, so they can be trusted. So how do we educate our dancers so they understand that? Yeah, I think you really hit the nail on the head with trust. We see that constantly. And and the, the culture of fear that exists because teachers and school administrators hold these kids' careers in their hands. And that's really, it's really scary when kids are being asked to give up any kind of control over their personal information. And so, yeah, we get it. We have, we actually offer a platform for people to submit reviews of year round ballet training programs. And then we also offer a platform for people to submit summer intensive reviews. And we get flooded with summer intensive reviews because people figure, you know, their kids there for four or five weeks, they have no skin in the game. But getting people to submit reviews of year-round programs has been absolutely like pulling teeth because I think it's what you were talking about is people, there's no trust. And people are worried that if they put some information out there, the school might be able to track back who it Mm -hmm. is and there might be blowback. And we've heard the same thing from students who say, you know, yeah, that's great. There's a therapist on staff. If you think I'm going to tell them anything, you're crazy. Mm -hmm. So how do you guys get around that part? Well, that's one of the reasons actually intentionally are, you know, my, my background is in psychology, but I refer students out to see therapists typically because I, I, it's important that they feel especially safe when they're sharing things related to mental health. And I have seen models where it's internal and I, I would feel the same way as a student at, at the school if it's if it's an internal. Yeah. So we want to support them. And so we have a great network in the community that I'm, you know, referring the students to when they come to me and say, you know, I, I, I could use some support. But intentionally, it's that piece specifically is outside of the school for the trust, a really piece of it. So I think that 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 is that is one important consideration that the school has a model the schools used for a long time and do think that the students value that, that they feel safe enough to come ask, not always, but to ask mm-hmm. through the artistic health department for help. But then they know that once it, it leaves us and they, they get referred that now they're in a, in a separate space. Do you find that the students believe that? Like once they go outside, do they feel like, okay, I, my confidence is going to be kept by this person? Trust always needs to be earned, right? Sure. And I think coming into this role, like I said, when we, we did that research study, it clarified that there, there was some hesitation. Mm-hmm. And again, the people that we work with are registered healthcare professionals. They're required to keep information confidential. And if things need to be shared, it's with consent. And so I, I really believe that it's modeling that practice, showing them that, that we can be trusted, having the integrity to not throw someone out because, you know, when they see that they're not being thrown out because they happen to have asked to go see a therapist, like all of that builds trust within the the student body, within like the the culture of the school. So I I don't think it's, it's something that needs to be ongoing, but I I really think that it's, it's integral. If we want our students to benefit from these services, they really have to believe that we're all wanting them to use them and, and benefit from them. Absolutely. And my son's a dancer and we've heard this from him that, you know, there's no way I'm going to go talk to anyone that's part of a school. So it's, it's really refreshing to hear that you're referring out. The other thing we hear a lot is, yeah, they say they have a therapist and they have one hour a week for the students. 
how do you guys handle that? Like, do you have the resources that um, outside to be able to handle all the demand? How, yes, we have the resources outside. We have quite a robust team. Fortunately, we uh, work with a few clinics in the community that, which is nice because also people have different expertise with somebody with an eating disorder needs someone very different than, than somebody, you know, with uh, performance anxiety potentially, right? Sure. It That is great. We also have, you know, been able to build a roster of people from with different cultural backgrounds, speaking different languages, which is important because we are like, we have an international student body. So this is right. this is a consideration as well. We have worked the last couple of years to kind of build, build a network. And what's a silver lining, I think, from COVID is that it's become easier to access support online. So students don't need to, in the same way, leave school to go and, and meet their therapist at their office, wherever it is. They can do it virtually. So instead of missing like three hours of, of <laughs> school, which, you know, then they're stressed, they don't want to miss class. It's just mm-hmm. one hour, right? They just go sit in the room for, for the 50 minutes and then they can get back to class. Um, so it's, it's a little bit less stressful that way. So I think that's been a silver lining of the pandemic that much of the mental health sector has become more open to practicing online. That's really great. And it's nice to hear that when kids need the resources that they are available to them. The other big piece of the puzzle is teachers, right? And most teachers are former professional dancers who got the training that they got, and it wasn't always with the whole person in mind. As you have been augmenting your wellness program, how have teachers fit into that? Like, is there a continuing education program? Because, you know, at some point that cycle has to be broken and you are a dancer, so you know, but what, how do the teachers fit into all of this? Well, I think we're also, again, very fortunate. A lot of our teachers, say the majority of them have done formal teacher training as well, not just, you know, experience as a professional dancer, which of course adds immensely because just because you are a brilliant dancer doesn't mean you have any idea how to work with children. That's a big piece. So we're already starting from a great base. I have brought in for professional development, different experts to, to also speak with artistic staff to give them information about how to navigate things. So for example, we had an expert come in and talk to staff about adolescents with ADHD, right? Because we see that in the studio. So, you know, just what it is and like how to navigate it and what are some strategies in the studio, not, you know, we have all these strategies for the academic classroom, but like, what does that look like in a ballet class? And those are the types, I think, of professional development, I think, that have been welcomed and, and useful. I think the teachers have found it really, really helpful to kind of, again, to when they started teaching, you know, young people were dealing with different things, right? So it's kind of mm-hmm. trying to understand how to meet the, the dancers where they're at in 2024. I love that. And so all of your teachers have gone through some sort of teacher training. Is that right? I don't want to say with 100% certainty, because I'm sure there are some exceptions. And but I would say the majority, yes, that that is said, typically, they have done teacher training. NBS has renowned teacher training program, both a three year program and a one year program for people who were professional dancers. So I I mean, I think it's really if you're going to make your life teaching young people, dance actually learning how to teach is is its own you know <laughs> skill set as you know so uh, i think it, it's it's really important you know the whole notion of like old school coaching in competitive sports and you know the the whole thing around like the old school football coach that's kind of toxic and borderline abusive but he gets results and so they kind of say oh well that's just him And, you know, you just have to deal with it, but he's a good, he's a good coach. You hear that in the ballet studio all the time that, you know, someone will say very problematic things and someone will just say, well, that's just her or that's just Mm -hmm. him. You just need to have a thick skin. It sounds to me though, like one of the things that NBS is doing is really working to try to eliminate that whole notion. So they are kind of breaking that cycle. Is that a fair thing to say? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's where like the the systematic changes in culture have been part of NBS long before, you know, my time. I think that's been something that's how the school has evolved, been been quite mm-hmm. unique. How colleagues interact with each other, how colleagues interact with uh, staff interact with students, that that, you know, modeling of, of respect is something that I see and, you know, have come to expect in our in our community here because 
when it's modeled and especially from, you know, from the top, when that's what's modeled and nothing else is tolerated, then that's how we all treat each other, which is why it's it's such a joy to work here. Well, it sounds like you guys have a, quite a robust system. So every program that has wellness programs or wellness systems, they have a fairly detailed set of protocols they follow when it comes to the wellness of their students. How do you balance the protocols to ensure that they're being implemented in the best interest of a particular student? Sorry, just repeat the last part. I just cut off for a second. Oh, sorry. How do you balance the protocols to ensure that they are being implemented in the best interest of a particular student? Yeah, that's a good, that's a great question. I think it's ongoing work to ensure that it, it it's con- constantly being reflexive and considering the situation at hand because you know there, it isn't one size fits all. You know, to do that is also not to be equitable and honestly not maximize effectiveness either. So I think that we have general protocols, ways we do things, but certainly each time we need to kind of address something, you know, there, there's conversation, there, there's pause and opportunity for, you know, different people to contribute their perspectives on what makes sense. You know, we've, we've learned from the last time this came up as something that we want to use to inform the situation as, as well. So we do have our, our protocols and approaches, but nothing is static. I think that's something that over time things get more and more established. But I, I like I said, I don't I don't really think it's ever going to stay still. I, I, I expect us to continue to evolve and to show up for whoever is showing up in our in our studios. So if a student is like you said, you, you know, if you learn from the way you handled something before, like, uh, what is a way that students or parents can kind of come forward if they really are not happy or really feel like things aren't managed in the best interest of their students? Well, th- there's a lot of ways to, to access it. I mean, historically, parents have and do reach out to our artistic director, to the head of our junior school with their concerns, to the health department, to the head of residence, to the academic principal. And they they should expect a response because we will respond. We're, we're here for the students and we want each student to, to realize, you know, their, their potential and to flourish. So if a student, if a parent comes forward with an issue we will absolutely make sure that we're going to listen and to consider what the the, the best thing um, moving forward should be. It's change. So you were a dancer, right? And you went through ballet training. And we've all heard stories, right, of what people's ballet training was like, good and bad, right? Like everybody has their story. You know, what has changed? Because there's this much more of an emphasis on wellness now. And based on your experience, you know, what are you bringing into that and, and what has evolved? A lot of things have, have changed. I mean, you, you need to zoom out and look at, you know, society at large too, right? Mm-hmm. People are not willing to tolerate the, you know, maybe the abuse that, that they experienced, right? Like a, a, a lot of things, you, we saw that, you know, there was the Me Too, Me Too movement and then there was Me right. Too movement in ballet. You saw it the ad- addressing anti-black racism and then addressing anti-black racism in ballet, right? Like it, it's, we, we are a reflection of, of society for sure. So it's important to, to point that context out. I think also though, that the dance sciences has have evolved greatly. Um, the, the sports sciences have been around for a long time and, you know, ballet, it is an art form, a thousand percent, but they, our dancers are also elite athletes. There's, there's a lot that we can, do we can look at the science and we can use it we can implement it in, in thoughtful ways to make our dancers lives better and i think there has been a, a large awakening because it, it it because it makes sense because we we have stronger dancers they dance longer they're healthier they they flourish they you know they, they do better and so i think there there's been a, an exciting move towards more evidence-based approaches, which is challenging when you're dealing with a tradition, right? Where t- ballet is a tradition, right? It's typically mm-hmm. passed on from generation to generation, which which has many beautiful aspects. In addition to that, the opportunity to inform it by just the, the exponential growth of knowledge we have as like, like, like the human species, I, I think mm-hmm. has just been also really empowering. So it's an exciting time. I think when we, you know, the Olympics are on right now and you see, you know, people are saying, well, why are, why are athletes so much better? Right. 
And, you know, there's, there's a variety of different reasons that people are proposing. It's the technology, it's the sciences, it's the the way we understand optimal, how to get to optimal performance. So I think, you know, it's an exciting time to be in our art form too, because we, we are seeing the, the results in our dancers as well. You mentioned the Olympics, which I think is interesting. And, you know, there was the other side of the Olympics when Simone Biles pulled herself out of Tokyo, how hard she took it on the chin. And people were saying, you know, you're a quitter. How could you let your team down? And so it's, you know, it's interesting. There's that positive uh, impact that more attention to mental health is seeing, but also there's still a large slice of the population that thinks that you're weak if you say that you need help. And so, you know, as much as I think we've taken major steps forward, I do wonder when it will be fully accepted by everybody. Yeah, that's a, a great point. How I see the life of a dancer, I see that identity being part of someone lifelong. So mm -hmm. it's you might have a, a you know a peak where you're you're a performer in a company, but that identity is with you, you know, hopefully long into older adulthood. And if we really are investing in a lifetime experience and a lifetime identity, then we have to look, think long-term um, in terms of how we're developing our dancers. We want them to be mm -hmm. able to flourish both on stage and in the other ways that they're going to contribute both to the ballet community or the dance community and to the community at, at large as someone who identifies as a dancer. So people with short-term views will, will make quick judgments, but I think what we need to do is look at the long-term evidence of what good is happening. And that, that will speak for itself. Sure. It's also really good business sense. You know, 50%, I think we saw a statistic somewhere that said 50% of ballet audiences are made up of former dancers. So if you come out of your ballet training or even your ballet career with your mental health intact, you're probably much more apt to be a subscriber to your local company or to at least go to a few performances a year versus the people that are coming out. And, you know, you, you see the books all the time about um, people who have come out of ballet training and are incredibly damaged and never want to set foot in the theater again. But to me, it just feels like good business to be doing that. Yeah, absolutely. And also, we know that having community is is such a benefit um, on many, many different levels as, as, an, as an individual, having a connection to a community. And so one of the challenges in transitioning for a lot of dancers, right, is a little bit of that sense of loss of, of their mm -hmm. identity and that, that community that they're so used to. So helping our dancers understand that, that no, you, you're always going to be part of this community is, I think, a profound strength of the ballet community. And uh, we need to keep supporting that and, and keep it going with the next generation. So what are you doing at NDS to help build a healthy community? What what programs do you guys have in place for that? Well, I think one thing that I, I'm, I've been quite privileged to be a part of is expanding our community beyond training me professional dancers. So, for example, a lot of my, my research and work has been in, in developing our programs for older adults. So, you know, the students in our professional program are seeing older people, two programs, uh, an older sharing dance, older adults and, and sharing dance Parkinson's, seeing older people with physical challenges, with cognitive challenges coming into their spaces, also coming into the studio, dancing to, to music and seeing the connection like that their art form, you know, the key elements of it, uh, the, the, the storytelling, the, 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 the connection that, that you make, the, the expression, the movement to music, obviously, that that, that, that is, goes far beyond the narrow slice of the experience of a dancer that that they have the privilege to experience kind of the the pinnacle of it but that the culture of dance goes far beyond that and i i've heard from students like it is impactful that they see multi generations people with different abilities also present at the school and dancing i think that that's something that you know historically wasn't an example so you didn't see a lot of older people around the building for a long time and the last decade that's really changed and so that's just one one example um, and we do have different types of community dance programs and i think that that also while the professional ballet program is sort of the, the like the central pillar to the school offers the student community a perspective that they're part of something bigger and the importance of that community 
Sure. But most of our listeners are parents of dancers. And so I think as they're looking for schools, they're, ballet schools more and more are becoming the only school these kids go to. And so looking for more kind of wraparound services. And it sounds like you guys are, are trying to do some of those things. So what what do you guys have in place to help students blow off steam in a healthier way to alleviate some of that stress that comes with high pressure full-time ballet training? Right. So what kind of fun things did they get to do? Yeah. Yeah. Like what do you guys do? That's part of culture too, right? Is to create community and to, and it's not to be, you know, ballet 24 seven and you go to the the studio and then you just go home and do schoolwork behind your door, right? Like what are you guys doing in terms of like for your dorms, for fun, you know, for stuff for the kids to do outside of just ballet the you know our head of residence could speak to this better but of course there's outings and such planned for our our resident students because it's it's a school like any high school right we have school dances we have you know fundraisers bake sales there's you know a strong student council so we do have some of that social activity that you would see in any typical high school going on here to your point about special activities it's fair that it they, their time is quite limited they they are expected to complete their academic credits while training right so this there's not a lot of time they they start early they end late and they they carry like a load of homework and you know typical many dancers you know are on the a little bit higher on the perfectionism scale. So they're going to spend a lot of time on their homework, right? Like mm-hmm. that, that is something that we are aware of. I mean, it is very much uh, something that we sometimes need to call out and, and, and check in. And I think that's one of the beauties of having our academic program and artistic program on the same campus, right? Because we can talk to the academic teachers, uh, you know, well, we can understand what's the schedule, you know, the pressure of, you know, their uh, performance coming up and, and this assignment coming up. And we can we can look to try and find that balance in terms of fun wh- where we can. We, we put it in and, and the students are quite good also at, at advocating for that. I think in some ways we, we we do encourage them to use their voice. You know, they've they, they have come up with some some really fun events and pitch them to staff that to, to, for them to host. So that is on them. But but you're absolutely right that that is something I think that we need to be mindful of is that. You know, these are really committed young people that sometimes forget that that there needs to be some balance, even when the demands are high, that they they can come to their work refreshed. So it's it's an ongoing issue, but we we're definitely trying to to weave it in when we can. So with that comes also the other side of you know adolescence, which is all the stuff that nobody ever wants to talk about. I mean, we I have teenagers, Jenny has teenagers. We have seen all of it. You know, one of the things about blowing off steam is sometimes kids do that in less healthy ways. How do you guys handle that? Especially when it comes to things like, you know, with dancers who are under this huge amount of pressure, sometimes they're doing it in ways that are not safe Mm -hmm. for them. So how do you balance kind of the, they're getting busted for doing something that is against the rules versus understanding why that's being done? Yeah. So NBS definitely takes a progressive approach, very clear of the things that they're not allowed to do on campus. If they get caught, we are trying to be very thoughtful about what built up to that. You know, Mm -hmm. how do we address it? And um, with each situation, we need to look at it as its own. It's not zero tolerance (laughs) is, is helpful going in, but zero tolerance isn't necessarily helpful in terms of how do you help the person who didn't understand what zero tolerance meant. I think, like I said, I, it, it's a it's a progressive uh, approach. Yes, we we have teenagers at the school, and and I'm grateful, like, to say that they're teenage <laughs> they're teenagers. Yes, they 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 are. Um, and so in in those moments, we we are looking to support the young person and typically involving their their family um, as best we can to navigate through you know whatever maybe poor decision that they made. Yeah, I, I I think it's important to remember, I mean, and I, I lived this with my son, where my son was engaging in reasonably unhealthy behavior, the what was always dealt with, right? Like what was happening was clear, but nobody ever asked why. Mm-hmm. And that is, I think that's really important when kids are living away from home, 
and basically being where the ballet school is their, their only school, as Jenny said. And so I love that you're saying that you are kind of saying, okay, why is this happening rather than just you did this and now there's punishment? Yeah, because I think, you know, the the implications can be lifelong, right? Like if you're mm-hmm. if you're sent home from ballet school, you know, maybe no other ballet school is going to touch you. That might be all your, your, all your hopes and dreams and career and everything you've worked for. So it's it's being very thoughtful about it. You still need to address issues and um, mm-hmm. you know, safety of, of all the students is very important, obviously. So, you know, we, we can't be having, you know, risky behaviors, but it is it is a very thoughtful process. And that's where I think, you know, we, we are so fortunate because we have expertise like our principal and vice principal have been part of the public systems here. Right. Like so they have that perspective, a lot of experience working with youth. So we have colleagues from with different areas of expertise to help. And we do work uh, as a, a strong team, um, the artistic, academic and health and residents uh, together, you know, when we're trying to find solutions to problems that students are having. I mean, it really sounds like your program is fairly comprehensive. So what part of this program are you most proud of? <laughs> I mean, I, I feel very fortunate because, you know, th- this culture was planted before me, right? So I kind of, you know, walked into a, a space where I, I feel like the students, I'm able to grow and, and ex- you know, I- explore fully the potential of the work that I'm, I'm doing here. In terms of huh, what, I, what do I feel most proud of? I think maybe it's, it's, it's really the integration and the the value of the, you know, the whole student, the whole human, the students that come through the school, really the the way that they're prepared, I think, to go into the the, the ballet world, but also in, to flourish in so many other ways. I mean, I'm I'm quite proud. We see students that really talented dancers, you know, that 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 graduate and decide, you know, to accept that place at Harvard or or Columbia, right? Like, and we celebrate that. I see the way that our students go off and lead the world in, in the, in the arts, but it, but in other sectors as well. And I, I really believe that that's a reflection of the values of our, of our school. So I think I'm most, most proud of that. And if I'm contributing at all to that, then that's really my privilege. That's lovely to hear. So post COVID we're I think we're all kind of wrestling with the kind of the mental health crisis of our youth. So what are you seeing is the biggest needs your students currently have? And are they using certain services more than others? Like elsewhere, we saw an increase, like generally in Canada, we saw an increase of eating disorders in youth. And we, we, we saw that reflected in even, you know, we, we've seen it more typically in our population too. So we did see a little bit of, of that bump as well. The anxiety is also something that we, we see, but it's hard to know because I think our young people are better at, at naming. I think they have more information, which is great to, to articulate what they're navigating and what their needs are. So it's not really, you know, you'll hear, oh, we never had that problem before. I'd be like, well, nobody knew what it was called or what, you know what to say. It doesn't mean that it wasn't <laughs> sure. there. There is stuff that I think I wasn't as aware of maybe in, in, in earlier generations. And I think, again, we have to zoom out and look at what else is going on in the world. And, you know, as much as our students are like in the studio or in the classroom all day, they're also on social media and seeing what's going on in our crazy world. And so we have to be ready to support that as well. And we are. And but I think that there is there is maybe a, a little bit more of an, a need for that right now than was it was in the past. You mean post COVID? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. It's it's hard to know, like I said, because there's many other factors. So I don't I don't want to say it with certainty, but it's possible. And that's certainly, those are the trends we see outside of, you know, of our little school, like we see in youth. And so Mm -hmm. I think that that's possible, but I think also, you know, that generation of young people that you missed a lot, you know, there were two, three formative years that they Mm -hmm. were locked down at home and, and the, the things, the social skills that they didn't develop, for example, the, the confidence has you know made them maybe a little bit shorter in, in, in courage to just just do it right mm-hmm. because when you there's that window in development where you're you don't have that guard up because you're less self-conscious because you're you know you're only 10 to just put yourself out there and then you build confidence because you you know you put yourself out there and it was okay so maybe 
maybe by 13, you now you haven't had practice, but you also ha- don't have the courage because you're so, so much more self-conscious and aware. Um, so I, I don't think it's unique to our students. I think it, mm-hmm. it's, it's kind of the trend that, that we're seeing. And then it, for me, it's really important. We just aware of it and making sure that if we see it in our students, that, that we are helping them to get effective help. So along those lines, where would you like to see wellness programs and not just at NBS, but across the board, where would you like to see wellness programs in ballet training go moving forward? So I think that ultimately we want to build support dancers who have the tools, you know, to flourish in their art form and as human beings. So I think the idea of of wellness programs is to educate to provide the support and, and tools, mm-hmm. I I don't, and this is where it's just a little bit of a balancing act, right? Like it's it's ultimately to give these dancers what they need to go out on their own. So it's that fine line, I think, in terms of balancing, making sure they have what they need, but not sort of preventing them from developing the confidence that they, they've got this. I'm very grateful for the resources that we are able to provide for our dancers, but just finding that the the right balance. So they're, they're not over overly reliant on somebody else to really help them know what they need, but also when they need help, that they know it and they know who to ask for. So I think that'll be a, a very good indication that our wellness program is moving in the, in the right direction. And then of course, to continue to evolve with the science, you know, the more we know about how to optimize performance, how to optimize injury prevention, recovery, things like that, that we're implementing that in in our approaches to training the dancers. That's a lovely place to end it, Rachel. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks so much for having me again. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel, for joining us today. If you would like to learn more about their programs or read Rachel's research, please head over to our show notes. If you're enjoying Ballet Help Desk podcast, please follow, subscribe, and leave a review. It really helps others find our podcast. Until next time, the help desk is now closed. Hey, moms, looking for some lighthearted guidance on this crazy journey we call parenting? Join me, Sabrina Kohlberg, and me, Andy Mitchell, for Pop Culture Moms, where each week we talk about what we're watching and examine our favorite pop culture moms up close to try to pick up some parenting hacks along the way. Come laugh, learn, and grow with us as we look for the best tips and maybe a few what not to do's from our favorite fictional moms. From Good Morning America and ABC Audio, Pop Culture Moms. Find it wherever you get your podcasts.